I'm Ratika, and I am resident storyteller with the Lean Startup Conference. One of the questions that comes up in the Lean Startup community is how to apply Lean methodology to more than just product development, to all facets of an organization. And today, we have Hilary Hartley, co-founder and lead creative at 18F, a digital services agency inside the General Service Administration. She's here to give us a deep dive into 18F, a lead startup inside the US government. She'll be joined by four of her colleagues who will give a few share case studies. Garen Givens, director of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Jennifer Tress, 18F talent director. Noah Kunin, 18F infrastructure designer. And Nick Brett Hauer, 18F designer. Please welcome Hillary and her team. Thank you, Ritika. Hi, guys. If you can hear me in the back, come on in. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we are here to take a little bit deeper dive into 18F specifically. And um, as Ritika said, we've got a few case studies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about 18F, how we operate as a lean startup inside the federal government. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper with four case studies around uh, infrastructure, talent, acquiring talent and hiring, and um, applying lean UX principles to things that are not products, and then talk a little bit about the Presidential Innovation Fellowship and how that itself is a lean startup. That's me. Uh, so I wanted to give you a very brief introduction, a little brief history of 18F. Uh, we actually came out of the Presidential Innovation Fellowship. Uh, in the, the fellowship itself started in 2012. Uh, there were 18 fellows that year. And um, in the second year of the fellowship, folks at the White House and inside the GSA thought that uh, in order to really be able to make this program scale and give it, give it a permanent home, we needed to bring it inside an agency that would have a budget, have personnel, have people that we could sort of apply to the, to the program itself. So brought the, the, the PIF program, as it became to be known, um, inside the General Services Administration. Um, the GSA is kind of the operational arm of the federal government. The two biggest services that it provides are uh, business, uh, no, not business, building management. So they're kind of the, the landlord for about 50% of federal buildings, everything from lighthouses to courthouses. Uh, acquisition services, so helping agencies buy and procure things from pencils to websites. And then uh, they're really sort of investing in technology services, uh, w of which 18F is kind of the tip of the spear. So at the end of 2013, there were several of us finishing up our six-month Presidential Innovation Fellowship. And there had been a lot of chatter inside the White House and inside the GSA of really trying to hire a, a permanent team, a team that could be on the ground to catch some of these projects that could you know, help take it from you know, really incubator stage to accelerator stage. And so 18F was born. Um, 18F is essentially a digital consultancy for the US government inside the US government. We are federal employees working alongside innovators in other federal agencies. And um, as you can see with a little map there, the name is actually an homage to 30 Rock. Uh, it's the, the uh, GSA headquarters itself, the building in DC is at the corners of 18th and F Street, thus the name. Over the last year uh, and a half, essentially, we really have embarked on, on this fundamental mission, uh, a mission to transform the way the US government builds and buys digital services. Uh, we are a, a product company, we are a platform company, we are a services company, we are sort of all of those things wrapped into this consultancy that is providing those services for other federal agencies that come to us with ideas, with projects, with, with products in mind, with, with blue skies, with you know, nitty gritty ideas. Um, but we're really kind of, we're working with, we've worked with over, I think, 20 agencies, uh, most, of the, most of the three letter acronyms that you could think of, to help them deliver on their missions in a design-centric, agile, open, data-driven way. We sort of rest on about, 
you know, five pillars, I like to say. The first one is that we're going to be the change. We really want to be leading by example. We're working with partners in the agencies uh, to kind of guide them through this new experience, resetting their, the bar, you know, resetting their expectations for how digital services can be delivered. We want to think like designers, not just the designers on the teams, but everybody, our product people, our engineers, everyone, you know, bringing that human-centered mentality, focusing on user needs first. User needs driving every decision we make, not stakeholder needs, not government needs, not agency needs. Uh, you know, there are, there are sometimes business models. Often those business models are the, are the law. But we are really trying to, to think outside of that box and say we want to focus on delivering the thing that the end user is going to, uh, going to use. Third is being you know, data-driven and being data-informed, using analytics to support all of those user-driven decisions, measuring everything, uh, being API first. When someone comes and says, you know, we've got a lot of data and we'd love to have an awesome website, uh, we say, well, we need to lay that plumbing first. We need to lay the foundation so that not only can we build something interesting on top of that data, but everyone else in, you know, sort of out in the, in the market could as well. <clears throat> being agile. Build, measure, learn, uh, quick feedback loops so that uh, small failures happen, but big failures don't. And finally, being open by default. We are uh, an open source, source team. Everything we do, really from day one on our projects, is out in the open. Uh, you can find us on GitHub. You, we are talking about it on our blog. We are really trying to be transparent, not only about what we're building and the things we're shipping, but about how we're working uh, as well, so that, that concept of, of uh, evangelism. So we went into the belly of the beast, and we're, we're bureaucracy hackers. We are, you know, uh, essentially trying to find those avenues of you know, the ways of getting things done. So, you know, th these probably sound pretty familiar. You want to find people who have solved similar problems. You want to uh, engage those stakeholders. You want to have a primary stakeholder. You want to build minimum viable products. These last two, I think, are the ones that are specific to government, to doing this in a large bureaucracy, which is that you have to respect the bureaucracy. You have to understand uh, what you're working with and who you're working with and how to get things done. And then once you find something that works, you want to formalize it and operationalize it so that you can do it over and over again. Uh, so the four people that are going to be talking today are going to be talking about how they have hacked their various bureaucracies and how they are using lean tactics, strategies, and agile methodologies uh, inside what might be the largest government or the largest bureaucracy uh, in the world. So welcome to the stage first, Garen Givens, the director of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Awesome. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, everybody. It is a big thrill to be here, and never thought that it would happen uh, inside the federal government, not as an entrepreneur, that I would get to talk about lean strategy. Um, my name is Garen Givens. As Hillary said, I'm the director of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. So this is what a typical day in government used to look like. Meetings, spending the entire, entire day planning uh, and scheduling, and then tomorrow, let's uh, spend the entire day uh, talking about why we didn't get anything done. Which is why the, pre uh, the Obama administration created the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. We wanted to bring the principles and practices of uh, the startup economy into the federal government. We wanted to find great innovators and technologists, uh, have them partner with uh, uh, federal bureaucrats on some of the hardest challenges that our nation faces. Can we reduce our veterans' backlog? Can we uh, make it easier to attain education opportunities? Can we uh, make uh, affordable health care uh, available to everybody? Um, and of course, uh, to do this, we have taken a lean approach to designing the program, not just in the solutions that we provide uh, and are a part of. The first thing I want to talk about is that org design matters. Your organization protects the principles and practices, uh, as well as the products that your company is built on. Uh, because we are a, uh, a team that believes in lean startup methodologies, because we follow a human-centered approach, uh, we wanted to make sure that our organization was built on these same foundational principles. Can we incorporate build, measure, learn feedback loops uh, into the program itself so that we are constantly iterating and making sure that we've designed the best possible platform for innovators to come into government and have an impact in months and not years. 
uh, we also want to make sure that when you're shipping a, a program or program frame, framework that you take a, a minimally viable approach to designing that organization. Um, I love this artist and, and chose this slide in, in particular. This is Brancusi. Works a little differently than you, a, a normal sculptor uh, who would add clay as you go and just continue to put features onto it. Uh, Brancusi sort of works backwards. Starts with all the material in the beginning and then starts to pare it back and reduce it down to just what the essence of uh, a particular form might be, in this case, a bird. And this is sort of what happened with the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Initially, we modeled our program off of existing fellowships in the federal government, in our case, the White House Fellows Program. White House Fellows is a 50-year-old program, had a lot of features and functions built into that program that weren't relevant to uh, Presidential Innovation Fellows or innovators and technologists. It wasn't lean. It didn't follow human-centered design principles. Uh, and so in that regard, we actually had to pare back some of the initial assumptions that we had made uh, about why people might be willing to join the federal government. Um, and once we got down to the essence of uh, focusing on sort of three things that we do really well, which is providing folks the opportunity to work on problems that matter at scale, uh, two, providing a uh, unique platform for evangelizing best practices and improving our federal government in the way that we deliver service, and three, creating a uniquely Washington, D.C. experience for fellows that is different uh, in, in all cases from what they've experienced in their career, we were able to then make sure that our framework and the operations that support the way we do business uh, actually enhance uh, and build on those sort of three uh, core tenets. Next, of course, we followed a build, measure, learn uh, 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 sort of feedback loop, um, making sure that we're incorporating uh, feedback at a regular cadence. So how can we make sure that fellows have the tools that they need to succeed, uh, both the technology but also the access to uh, one another and the knowledge sharing? A one-year fellowship program has some natural breaks built into it, uh, which is uh, nice, unlike uh, an or a product organization. Uh, the sort of institutional memory erases itself um, regularly. The problem is that one year is, is a very long sprint. <laughs> and so getting the information back into the consciousness of the program needed to happen faster. So one of the ways that we've iterated more recently is to move to a rolling admissions model. This allows us to build in feedback as we go. So just as new fellows are joining our program, others that have gained uh, a certain knowledge from their experience are able to convey that and transfer it to others coming into government. Uh, finally, we really want to ensure that uh, management in the organization uh, understands that the organization itself is a work in progress, uh, that you're going to continue to evolve and iterate, um, and that your typical back office functions uh, that truly, uh, if designed effectively, support uh, what your actual product is in the marketplace, uh, that those will need to uh, continually evolve uh, with the life of the program. So uh, I'm going to give the, the president uh, an opportunity uh, to define and describe sort of what we've done in the last few years and see if you can pick out some of the language that our CEO uh, uses in uh, talking about the program. Hi, everybody. When I took office, one of my top priorities was to apply lessons we'd learned in our innovative high-tech campaign in 2008 to make the federal government smarter, more innovative, more transparent, and more responsive to the American people we serve. One of the ways we've worked to do that is by recruiting incredible talent from the private sector, engineers, startup founders, and developers, for tours of duty, working alongside some of the best public servants in government. Three years ago, we launched the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, and in that time, our fellows have delivered some remarkable results. Thanks to their efforts, veterans have enhanced access to the care and benefits they've earned, families have greater access to their own electronic medical records, police departments are making their data searchable online, more of our students gain access to high-speed internet in their schools every single day, and these fellows are helping us upgrade the way Americans interact with their government online which, as anyone who's visited a government website will tell you, was sorely needed. So what began as an experiment is becoming a success. That's why I'm making it permanent. From now on, Presidential Innovation Fellows will be an integral part of our government. My hope is this continues to encourage a culture of public service among our innovators and tech entrepreneurs 
so that we can keep building a government that's as modern and innovative and as engaging as our incredible tech sector is. To all the fellows who've served so far, I want to thank you. I encourage all Americans with bold ideas to apply. I can't wait to see what those future classes will accomplish on behalf of the American people. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, President Obama. Uh, um, how cool is that? Right. <laughs> right. So as you heard the President say, what began as an experiment is becoming a success. It's words like pilot and experiment that have uh, helped us to be successful in these early years by making sure that we inculcate within government a culture of experimentation, of evolution, of constant iteration and Kaizen. Uh, we uh, have ensured that a program like ours will hopefully have a home to continue to experiment, to improve, uh, and frankly, uh, to fail. Uh, and fail forward as we develop solutions that improve the way our government serves the American people. Um, so I want to thank you for giving us the time. And if you uh, feel that uh, you are one of us and want to use your kung fu for good, we encourage you to apply to the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. I'm certain that there is a home for you somewhere in government. Uh, and so in that regard, I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, our Director of Talent for uh, 18F, the sister organization of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, Jennifer Tress, to come share with you what we're doing uh, to make sure that innovators like yourselves uh, continue uh, to be a part of the change that we want to see. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Garen mentioned, I am the director of the talent team for 18F, and prior to joining 18F, I worked on the outside but with government. I worked as a consultant working with executives in federal agencies to uh, set their human capital strategy and make sure that the program offices were working with the HR shops to improve hiring operations. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, I'm a writer, I'm a storyteller, and I am a deep evangelist for incremental small change being the right approach for sustainability and adoption. Now, hiring is hard. Hiring in a startup is even harder. Hiring as a startup in the federal government is potentially the hardest because you are bringing in innovators uh, who are passionate, who have never worked with the federal government before in many cases, who are trained to disrupt and to push and to build and to just fucking do it, and then you place them in a bureaucracy, and you hear a lot of, no, or there's a policy around this, or you can't. And that can cause a lot of natural tension. So um, I want to talk to you today about what are some of the challenges that we've faced a year and a half into our existence? Uh, what are some of the strategies we've used from Agile and Lean to bring to the table to resolve some of those things? And then what are some of the results that we've achieved? So when I came on board in January 2015, I uh, came on board to a group that had grown from 15 of its original initial founders to about 70 people in 10 months. And um, the, uh, the demand for our services was extremely, extremely high. Um, we had a great stable of uh, clients and projects that we were working on, but we were having to turn down projects because of capacity. We were taxing our current staff members because they were filling holes on the teams that uh, engagements that already existed. And uh, that created a really tough piece for us because uh, there was that combined with the hiring latency that can exist in government, uh, where when I first started, it was around four to six months on average to bring a person on board from candidate ID to start date. And that created a real chicken and egg situation where it was really difficult to bring new business on board when you didn't know if you had the resources to staff it and vice versa, you'd get the resources to staff it but didn't have the business, it became this like continual issue, right? And that put a lot of pressure 
on a small distributed team that I had. So again, when I came in in January, I had two program assistants, one based in San Francisco, one based in DC where I am, and we had a huge queue. As the president said, there's that call to action, and we like to call it a tour of duty, right? That you're coming in and serving your country. And that call has been answered in loudly and in huge numbers. I think we were really surprised at how truly little recruitment was needed for people who wanted to engage at least a year with us and serve their country and do these things. It's just incredible and we are so grateful for it. But that team was constantly fielding things from hiring managers, I need my people! And um, you know our business leaders who were like, where are the people? And it was very difficult to manage because we also didn't have a lot of processes and tools at our disposal. What we were using uh, were Google Sheets. And there were spreadsheets upon spreadsheets. There were trackers and trackers, and we had trackers that were tracking our trackers. And when you have the absence of tools, people then become sort of like, I'm going to create my own tools and the response to that. So you'd sort of uncover all of these things. So our own team was sort of constrained by that. And then it was also a constraint for our subject matter experts who were evaluating these people and, and deeply supporting that process, right? We had, uh, and when we were small, it was okay, because it's easy when you're small to just talk to each other, to do an interview, to say, this is what I really need on the team, to bring people in, do an interview. Yeah, do you want to hire this person, yes or no? But as you grow, that becomes much more difficult to do, and that's not scalable, right? And so we were looking to really develop tools that would help scale that. Um, and it's interesting, before I go to this last piece, um, I, I, when I first came in, I talked to my good friend Garen here, who just described the awesome PIF program, which one's totally, like, trains on time to a T. And he said, Jen, you might want to adopt, you know, some of the things that we're doing here. You might want to take this process and really use it for 18F, because we're close, but two distinct programs. It's like, oh, thanks, buddy. I really want to innovate, though. I want to work in this small change within you know, this process. I'm OK. I'm OK. Thanks, though. And so we did that for a little while. Uh, we were able to put together some tools for our evaluators and our team, strong job profiles, deep criteria that aligns with those job profiles so that it's very clear what you're hiring for and much easier to make decisions. We were put sprints in place, interview sprint days, which took away the randomization of interviewing so it didn't become this sort of, hey, who can talk to a candidate at 2 o'clock today, right? It was a day every two weeks where a batch of 15 employees usually went through, uh, or candidates, and then we were able to make same-day decisions decisions on whether we want to hire or not hire. So we were working that through. However, uh, as we were innovating, I keep going ahead one, but I apologize for that. As we were innovating, um, it became tough too. As we grew, it became tough. So as we grew, uh, we were finding there were issues that are arising as anything happens, right, when you get too big. So now we're 150 people. Uh, in a year and a half, we've had super fast growth, and so these things naturally come up, right? Performance issues, a conflict, um, dealing with uh, what is my career ladder, you know, all sorts of things. Supervisors need help supporting their function. And so with no team to go to to sort of support that, we absorbed that on the talent team because that's where employees wanted to go. And we felt it was the right thing to do. So we're absorbing these functions while we're trying to manage recruitment, hire against goals, and that can become difficult. And as I mentioned, a startup culture really, you know, uh, conflicts with bureaucracy. So we were hiring not wallflowers in any way. We were hiring innovators who wanted to, again, disrupt and push. And so us as the talent team, we were constantly getting pinged by our hiring managers, by our employees. Where's my referral? Where's this person in the process? Where's this person for my team? We were constantly getting that feedback. And uh, we were pivoting to be able to be responsive to that. But we weren't doing it in a way that was sort of Let's collect this in a meaningful way. Let's learn, build, and uh, measure, right? Um, what we were doing was being agile, but we weren't really being agile. So what was our resolution? Part of it was a deep belief that I have that you have to hire people that are smarter than you where you are areas in areas where you're deficient. And the talent team had did not have its sort of stakes in agile lean philosophies. 
And so we were really looking for a lead that could do that. And we found him, funnily enough, here at this conference. If I could just mention Bill Rooney, if you could just wave your hand, I know you're here. Bill was here last year and heard Hillary Hartley speak and then applied to us and we hired him six months later. Um, and he has really brought a uh, leadership position that is really necessary to carry this amongst the team. Uh, when he first talked to me, his background was in uh, technical recruitment from the gaming industry. And that's what I was primarily looking for at the offset of building my own team. And he came on, and the first call, I'll never forget having that talk with him, where he said, uh, you know, I can really, I can serve as this recruitment lead for you, but what I really want to play in is the process piece. I really want to play in that area. Is that OK? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, like that's a deep need. Please, please play in this area. So he did. And he uh, started us out in a real, uh, a totally new process in that we are building products to serve user needs. Instead of it being a one off sort of thing, oh, let's quickly pivot here and never learn or document and make it stable, uh, he's helping to bring that to bear. So we develop product state, we would develop problem statements via user stories. We have our own backlog, like you would with any product, of user stories. We document our assumptions around that. We have hypotheses. We then have two-week MVP sprints to validate them. And then how we build it is through user research collaborative, highly visible work systems. So we use Murally a lot. We use stand-ups to uh, construct things. We prioritize with a focus on shipping a product. And then we hold retros to continuously improve. So I wanted to sort of show you some examples. And it was in, we had to start out simple. Because again, in this team, the talent team, at about this time had grown to eight people, uh, serving a group of about 150. and it was essential that they got their sea legs in this, right? That they couldn't, because as you start to go through this new process, this is a vocal group, and they started sort of saying, why are we doing this, and having frustrations, and I don't get this, and you have to start out with simple products and pick them through that in order for them to adopt this as a method that we will use from here on out. So a simple product that we showed around this is our communications of our 18F offer right, as a product, first product here. Now, it can be sort of confusing because truly when um, in, the, in the current, and, and I'm going to show you like old process, we, um, it was HR who was actually qualifying our folks. Even though we were doing the resume reviews, even though we were doing uh, interviews and providing our selectees to HR, they were the ones at the end who were qualifying them, which is different from the PIF process in which they are doing the qualifying up front and HR is accepting that. So uh, in their qualifying, it became a sort of weird communications vortex for us to be able to say to a candidate, you've been hired, because it wasn't until HR could qualify them that that decision would be fully made. So that communication became weird, and sometimes candidates would come back to us and say, I don't get it. Am I hired or not? And well, you almost are. And so this offer letter was essential. So our user story we came up with was, as a candidate, I want a written 18F congratulatory lever that is letter that is informative, that is engaging, and motivating. Oops, the hypothesis is that we have an exciting letter that will have a lower dropout rate from a decline rate, and that candidates will be more engaged throughout the process because it is fairly long once you go through the process, security, all that sort of stuff, right? And then the metrics that we use are acceptance rate after receiving that letter, engagement of the candidate after letter. So time it takes for them to respond, the amount of content or expression of attitude and communications, right? So um, that's a simple place. And once the team got excited about working in this, uh, we moved on to more complex issues and complex products to develop. And this summer, um, was one of those times that we had to move to a complex place. Now, we had been working with HR and had informally begun publicly announcing the types of roles that we wanted to hire. And because we had come up with strong role descriptions, we wanted to put that out there because that's we were born out of a referral network, and that's not very inclusive in the long run, right? You, don't, you want people who are not going to look like you because all of the users of America, in order for us to advocate for them on those systems, we have to build a team of diverse people who also have those perspectives. And so it became clear that um, 
we, as we, we moved into that, like, okay, let's keep publicly announcing stuff, HR came to us in their risk compliance mode and said, you're in danger here of not complying with certain federal regulations. Let me just say, HR is our partner on this. They came to us rightly on this and said, you're in danger in this, and we want to help you get there. So this is not, like Hillary said, a place where uh, we should constantly be butting heads, but a place where there is a need for collaboration and constant talking to work this through. So in that flip, we had to then overall that system. And so in doing so, where Garen came to me 10 months earlier and said, you should do this, I, I, he's able to now say, I told you so. And so we were flipping over to that process. However, we are still able to customize and innovate according to our own team's needs. And now what we've been able to force through this system are a brand new application, uh, new criteria, significant content that goes to um, our system, and we're able to reduce time associately. And here's, a, here's what our mural board looks like. So this is typically how we work. Uh, there are user stories. There are to-dos that we have. In progress, there are role-based pieces here. So everybody on the team, which is represented by those small circles there, they are role. They have roles, whether it's communications, whether it's uh, processing, whether it's data reporting. They all have roles. And the roles that they provide on that product shipment are based on what their ownership is on the team. Now, the results. We've had adoption of this. This is a thing now that our team is, it is embedded, it is institutionalized. We had a highly resistant staff, but thanks to Bill and working this, we've been able to get some clear adoption. So much to the point that all of my team's training programs are all like, I think I want to be a scrum master now. Or I want to do agile now. And so that's like, a very clear thing for me. We also have deeper openness and inclusivity because of those collaborative, visible work systems. It's easier to see what we're tracking, what we're doing. Questions from employees and comments from employees have gone down significantly because of the products that we've delivered, not only in our team, but with the help of the entire 18F team, which often pivots to support where a critical need is. And time to fill openings going down to three months with a hope that we get it down to 2.5 in the next couple months. So thank you so much. I totally appreciate your time. And I'm going to introduce you now to Noah Kunin, who is our Director of Infrastructure Services at 18F. Thank you so much, Jen. And thank you for coming and talking to us today. We really appreciate it. We're going to have Q&A and end, so please hang out after we're done with all the lightning talks. As it says up there, I'm Noah Kunin, I'm the Infrastructure Director for 18F. The talk today is about bureaucracy hacking our way to the cloud, but not in so much how we got to the cloud in government, which was a monumental task, but what we had to do once we got there to really deploy, build, measure, learn cycles within government where they hadn't been doing it previously. And this was really important to 18F because on our public website, on the way that we described ourselves to the world, we said, at the top, delivery is the strategy, so we better have a way to deliver. And coming right off of Jen's presentation, the main hypothesis on why government wasn't delivering effective, efficient digital services to society was staff, was people. We didn't have enough people in government. Over the past 20 years, the private sector has gotten, unsurprisingly, really competitive over these people. And most of these people have left for the private sector, and we haven't made it an appetizing place to come back into public service, and that's what's changing now. Quick time out, a little bit about my background and my perspective on this problem that we had to solve um, is that previously I was at a think tank called the Sunlight Foundation. And the Sunlight Foundation runs on public data. We take open data from government and transform it into accountability and transparency for the public into government. And the problem was we couldn't get these data feeds. We couldn't get these bulk downloads. We couldn't get these APIs. Why was government so bad about presenting this information to us when we know they wanted to? So eventually I was given the opportunity to join a new federal agency to try to figure out why these problems were happening called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They came out of the Wall Street Reform Act after the Great Recession and quickly learned the same things we learned at 18F. It's all about the people. And after we had all this great, amazing team de deploying these amazing pieces of software internally, we finally got to the point, it's great, we have all these amazing systems, let's ship it to the public, right? Let's get some you know, container ships here and get it out there. And what would happen? this would happen. And I don't need to belabor this point. You know, everyone knows about the very public failures of government technology over the past few years, and they're endemic. 
right? It's just the major ones that you see on the front page of Washington Post or New York Times or what have you. So why did this keep happening? Deploying software is no longer, it really was never rocket science, and we should know most rocket scientists work for the federal government. So what was going on here? Well, maybe our launch checklist was bad. Okay, and that makes sense. It's really important to have a launch checklist when you're launching a rocket ship. It's pretty important for software, too. So let's take a quick look at the US government's digital launch checklist. Well, the first thing you would want to look at is records management. Records are really important to the federal government. We have over 200 years worth, so that's important, makes sense. Well, you need to make sure that the data that is inside those records stays private, goes to the right people. That's important, too. Well, there's also this thing called the record schedule. We actually have a national archive, and you need to hook up with them and ship it, records to them on a particular time frame, but they don't have APIs, so you've got to set up an FTP server or actually burn DVDs for them, so that's a lot of work. Well, how did you get that information in the first place? Well, there's this thing called the Paperwork Reduction Act, which governs your collection of data, and after that, you need to look at Section 508 and accessibility standards, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, if you're buying anything that goes into this system. Well, of course, that brings up the Anti-Deficiency Act, the Economy Act, the E-Government Act, the Computer Matching Act, the National Cyber Protection System, the guidance for agency use of third-party websites and applications, the social media and web-based interactive technologies, which brings up, of course, Office of Management Budget Circular A130 Appendix 3, and the Federal Information Security Management Act, the Federal Information Processing Standard, FIPS 199, FIPS 200, FIPS 140-2, the Special Publication 800-37, Dash 53 Revision 4, it's really important you get Revision 4, not Revision 3. Special Publication 860 Volume 1 and the infamous Volume 2. And at that point, as a technology and government, you're ready to continue to read Special Publication 800-1895, 133, 137, 171. And of course, that brings up the Trusted Internet Connection 2.0 Reference Architecture, Einstein Compliance, very important, FedRAMP, OMB guidance on third-party websites and applications that is different from the guidance on the previous slide. OMB memo-1404, dash 1501, and yes, those are dates, and they keep coming out with more, but let's cut it there. And would anyone like to guess at how many pages in total you would have read at this point? Just yell it out. I'll repeat it from the mic. Anybody? 6,000. Uh, that's pretty darn close. It's a little bit aggressive. It's 4,006. Um, but that's still a tremendous amount of information to compress in one person's head, and it's frankly impossible. And right now, we're not even talking about local agency guidance. So if you're working for the Department of X, they will have standards, guidance, rules that you will have to consume as well. So I read all of that twice. And while that made me into some, like, some weird rabbinic scholar, right, of federal compliance bureaucracy, it didn't solve the problem put forth at the beginning of how we were going to get these build, measure, learn cycles into government. Right? And because we don't have one of these, how long is that process going to take? And by how long that process is going to take, I mean from completing the system, from having a 1.0 or a 2.0, getting it to the public. Right? And again, just yell it out. Any guesses? Heard of six months. That's actually at the low end. Right? It's six to 14 months. And there are a lot of outliers even above that. Right? I've seen 18 months. I've seen 24 months to ship anything. And this is utterly destructive to the build, measure, learn cycle, right? And it's not just destructive to that cycle, it's destructive to team morale. This is what my teams would look like after this process. They're not learning anything. They've been a, in a Jumanji pocket universe for six to 14 months, right? We got them so excited about working for government, we're gonna change things, it's really happening this time. Not so much. And that brings up this larger point, which is that it's part and parcel of failing around production around failing around compliance, right? It's the same core problem is that we don't have enough velocity. We don't have enough movement to actually change and meet these new compliance requirements, right? Every change in production results in a new cycle of compliance assessment. And that was slowing us down in an unacceptable way, and especially around the issue of security, right? Increasingly now in the 21st century, speed is the new security, because you get hit once and that's it, right? There's no like light taps anymore in cybersecurity you're either not getting hit or you're knocked out, right? So we really need to optimize for speed in order to keep us safe. And in order to get that build, measure, learn cycle in a highly regulated environment, it's the same problem in finance, the same problem in healthcare, you need to bake those controls in at a lower level, right? So we've been working on something that we call cloud.gov, and it went into private beta, so even the platform itself is going through this build, measure, learn cycle. And um, it's been a huge success so far. So all 4,006 pages are more or less baked into the platform so developers can just take an idea, get it up, and get it to the public fast. 
We're starting to deploy this across the rest of government, and we hope to um, improve it as time goes on. Uh, what's next after that? Um, how do we make that compliance process even faster? Right now for us, it still takes around six to eight weeks. How can we bring that six to eight week cycle, which is now down from six to 14 months, down to two to four weeks, right? Three things we're gonna do is we're gonna do a lot more alerts, and wow, that is causing some serious issues for epileptics in the background, so I'm gonna keep going. It's more alerts, right? It's better game day planning. One of the problems we're having is we fail so rarely now that when we do fail, it still happens, we're not experienced, right? You know, it's like, wait a minute, wh where are all the buttons I need to hit? So we need to simulate failure on a more frequent basis, right? And we need better visualization tools. We already have a few, um, but we need a lot more of them. We need ones that are much better than the ones we have right now. Uh, again, we're gonna do Q&A at the end. Uh, please do bring up any questions. There's gonna be mics up, but in the meantime, let me introduce my peerless peer, Nick, who's gonna talk to you about UX design and the Lean Enterprise. Hello, my name is Nick Brethauer, and I am part of the design team at ETNF. So this past year at ETNF, uh, we've been growing at an extremely fast clip, as has been mentioned. Uh, what started out as a handful of people in early 2014 is now over 160 designers, developers, project managers, talent folks, and, and others. Um, and so with this kind of fast growth, obviously comes some interesting challenges, uh, like what should our culture look like? Uh, how are we going to design it? How are we going to sustain it and maintain it? Um, what design practices should we be using in our organization? Uh, how do we want to do design and user research in an agile? How do we want to onboard our clients and, and do, do our process of client education? Um, so let me grab the clicker here. OK. So early on, we asked ourselves, um, what's the best way for us to grow and meet these challenges. Uh, we're a fairly flat organization, uh, but at any point in time, our leadership at ATNF could have said, okay, here's the model that we're gonna use uh, for, for working, here's how we're gonna work, but they didn't do that. Interestingly enough, they decided, they made an active choice to build ATNF and let it grow in a lean, experimental way. All right, so how are we doing that? In this talk, I'll share a specific example about how we used, how we adapted a Lean UX framework to um, basically empower our volunteer working groups uh, to address organi organizational changes and build 18F, 18F up in a kind of a, a bottom up organic way. So, okay, in true Lean style, um, here's kind of our, our big hypothesis. We believe that making it easy for anyone to engage with and self organize around initiatives to build up the organization is going to result in more and better organized initiatives and sustainable growth. And the kind of metrics we're looking for are um, that we will see organic propagation of development and design practices, increased knowledge sharing between the teams, and it gets easier for new folks to come in and be a part of the culture and, and new, easier for new folks to, to, um, to spin up groups and, and work on the culture. So put a little more, more simply and a little more uh, specific to, to Lean UX, we believe that making it simple for anyone on staff to structure their way, to structure their work on our organizational challenges in a lean way will result in more engagement, better solutions, and ultimately a better organization. And we're gonna know we're right when we see the, propagate, the natural pop propagation of um, practices and standards. Okay, so how does Lean UX fit in here exactly? Um, here are the typical components that are usually a part of Lean UX in a product design context. You've got your research and discovery, uh, your framing of your problem, understanding and prioritizing your target users, uh, defining your outcomes that you're going for, mapping your assumptions, and creating your hypotheses, and then running experiments in an iterative fashion. Um, and some of our teams at 18F, not all of them, have been using Lean UX in this product design context. So with those teams, we saw that it was giving them a ton of value in terms of providing a specific structure and a process to focus on outcomes and, and work using lightweight experiments. Um, and so that seemed to be a really, uh, really natural fit with how we wanted to grow. So that's all well and good for a product team with a UX designer or someone that can kind of uh, facilitate that process and lead the team through that process. 
Um, but what about the, the mix of people that are doing the work of building up your organization kind of early on? Um, they're not necessarily designers, and they are not necessarily working on these problems in a dedicated team. At 18F, they were certainly not. We have uh, basically at 18F, our org builders are folks that are just volunteering their time. They're slivers of time outside of their main client work that they're doing. So we knew we wanted to harness the power of Lean UX uh, to help these groups plan and do their work. To do that, um, there were two main challenges that we needed to solve. Figure out basically how to uh, make Lean UX uh, accessible to anyone to be able to use, basically put it, uh, create a framework um, that wouldn't require a background in Lean or in UX so that anyone could actually run the process. And number two, to make sure that we're minimizing the operational overhead in the work that these groups are doing. So make, reducing the amount of time that it takes for groups to start up and then and also uh, reducing the amount of time that it takes for them to kind of figure out their process and actually start delivering work. So after many iterations, um, this template was born. And it's really simple. It's a Google Doc. Um, it's basically a simple distillation that guides the group through the essential pieces of Lean UX. Without necessarily realizing that you're doing it, it walks you through the steps to create a hypothesis. So you say, the group looks at this and says, OK, who are we trying to impact with our work? Uh, what are the goals that we're trying to meet? How are we going to know we're, that we're right? What are the uh, potential actions that we could take to get there? And then, not on this slide, but, but below there, for each of the hypotheses that's created, there's a section for, talking, for listing out assumptions. So you re rearrange those a little bit, and you end up with kind of a classic lean hypothesis statement. We believe that doing this for these users will result in these outcomes, and we'll know we're right when we see these metrics. OK, so with hypotheses set up, we then follow a pretty similar structure to an agile, uh, two-week agile sprint, only it's done on a quarterly basis instead. So planning happens at the beginning of the at the beginning of the quarter, and then the weekly meetings uh, basically become like a check-in and a scrum, and an opportunity for new folks who have joined 18F to to jump in and plug into those initiatives. Um, and then there's a retrospective and review at the end of the quarter. Um, not all eight groups at ETNF have adopted this approach, uh, which kind of gives us a nice control. But the ones that have have been super well organized and have achieved some really cool stuff. So I'll go through quickly a few, few examples. Um, last quarter, our user research working group um, worked used this framework to, to articulate these outcomes that they've very arguably uh, succeeded in getting to. Um, the project teams can easily and su successfully re recruit users, that our product teams are able to successfully anticipate and navigate around the Paperwork Reduction Act, which uh, I think Noah mentioned, but it basically, it's a federal regulation that impacts the way that we can do user research in government. And then number three, by the time they start working with us, our clients are fully aligned with our expectations around how we're going to do user-centered design. Another quick example, we have a documentation working group. This past quarter, they've been working on these things, improving the onboarding process so that new folks get up to speed faster, making it easier for individuals and teams to share knowledge across the organization, and making it easy for staff to understand the state of teams and projects. All right, so here's a few of our 18F working groups. Um, but what's the impetus for a group to be formed? Uh, problem inputs can come from anywhere. But nine out of 10 times, they come from an individual or a team in the organization that encounters a specific problem that becomes a barrier to their work. And so they self-organize self around solving that. Um, and we usually we try to encourage them to do some lightweight user research with the rest of the organization to make sure that the problem that they're encountering kind of crosses, crosses uh, the boundaries in the organization and, and affects others as well. So um, we're still learning. Um, but I think our hypothesis is being borne out. We've seen a lot of results from these groups, uh, and our practices are, are indeed being pushed forward. So I'm going to recap uh, real quick kind of the five key benefits that I think that this framework provides. Uh, number one, the simplicity of this framework makes it really easy to start and structure a group. 
the self-documenting nature of the framework as you build out your hypotheses makes it really easy for other people to kind of jump in and work on that. And it also makes it really easy for the rest of the organization to see what a specific group is working toward and why they're doing that. Um, by making it easier to do, it lowers barriers to participation in this. So um, more easier to participate means more engagement, more participation, more engagement, and ultimately more buy-in into the culture and practices that we're, that we're creating through these groups. And number four, the approach reflects and reinforces our organizational values, which are lean experimentation, outcomes, and thinking about impact first. And number five, it encourages bottom-up growth, which lets people work on the organization and the areas that they are truly passionate about. Um, because I, I think we found that people will buy into what they've helped to build. Um, so to wrap up, I think that I would just say, uh, as we get closer to the 200 person mark, um, we're getting to a new tipping point, and I think we'll have to continue to adjust uh, how, we, how we approach this. And I predict that, for example, we'll probably need more dedicated roles uh, and teams to manage some of these things. Um, but the important thing is that when going from zero people or like a handful of people to the number of people we have now, uh, that the kind of core culture and practices of our, of our organization has been created. Um, and we have these practices and cultural norms that have been deliberately designed by the people that are, that are working within them every day. And I think that lean has been a big part of that. So thank you. And now I'll welcome Hillary back up to the stage. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Um, I don't know if you guys want to all come up on stage. Uh, we'll just do a few minutes of Q&A. And uh, happy to answer any questions about any of the presentations, um, specific, big picture, anything. Um, Sean has a mic, and we'll roam throughout the audience. So yeah, we'll love to do some Q&A. Can you give an example of what you mean by hacking the bureaucracy? Go for it. Hey. Um, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was can you give us some examples of hacking the bureaucracy? Um, that means something really straightforward. So if you can think of the law, the law of our society, the US law, that's like machine code, right? It's almost at the level of like zeros and ones. There's no abstraction, right? You, then you have assembly code, then you have object-oriented code. You have additional layers of abstractions. It must obey the laws underneath it, right? But you don't have to worry about those things. Somebody is still you know, writing assembly code for iPhones, right? But you're actually writing applications on the iPhone in Swift. We don't have that level of abstraction in government bureaucracy, right? So in a system where even from one slice of it, can I deploy this technology to the public and government? And it's 4,006 pages, there are references, there are dependencies, right? There are circular loops that you can take advantage of, right? And it's not circumventing the law, it's actually using it. There are interfaces, there are API endpoints in there, as it were, that no one knows about because there's just so much information, yeah. right? Um, so that's right. normally what we mean. And again, it doesn't just apply to my area. It's the same issue when we're talking about um, HR recruiting or any of the other bureaucracies that we need to deal with. The federal government is just so big. Um, there are opportunities in there that no one knows about. One of the bigger pictures there, uh, specific to kind of bureaucracy hacking, is that I think um, there's a lot of things that are probably standard operating procedures that have been standard operating procedures for so long that they are interpreted as law. It is how we do things. We cannot do them any differently. And so you bring a bunch of people in from the private sector that say, why not? And you start getting some different answers. You start being able to root around some of those things that we find out, actually, the law says this. We are in compliance with that. You know, everything, I'll give a very specific uh, example of what Noah's been dealing with when we first started. Um, we, in order to, to put a website online, you have to have something called an authority to operate. You have to answer 300 different questions, you know, paragraph format. It's a security documentation process. Um, we were doing that for every single website that the federal government puts online. 
what Noah, it, it, his brilliant hack to that was, listen, this stack of technology has already been cleared. We are going to use that paperwork again, and all we have to document is this new piece. Nobody had ever done that before. So it's little things like that that we're just kind of, be, it's almost because we're coming at it with fresh eyes, we're able to say, we shouldn't have to do it that way. Let's dig a little deeper. And it's not because no one wanted to do that. Everyone in government was like, why can't we do this, right? Like, that wasn't rocket science. It was just the new technologies that allow us to guarantee those lower level controls on the stack weren't in government, right? Because it's a catch-22. How would you have gotten that new technology in government to implement the better system to run through less of the compliance if you take the new technology through the compliance too? And then that's where it just comes back to leadership, to bust those myths, to get in the new technology, to get into that you know, effective build, measure, learn cycle that we're all looking for. I think there was somebody else on this side. Thank you all for presenting. This was a really interesting part of the conference. Um, Jennifer, you were talking about building products for user stories. Uh, how do you collect those user stories, and how has it changed over the last year? That's a great question. Um, we collect them through our various channels. So we have either it's forums, open forums, where we're just having retros with you know, people that we work with. It's our emails, it's our Slack channels, it's our, you know, uh, side, sideways, sideways? Hallway conversations. <laughs> sideways conversations involve wine, apparently, yeah. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. Yep. Oh, got it? Oh, you go. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Kevin DeBelli. I work at EPA, so we are neighbors, and one of the, knowing that you folks can't do everything for everybody in this huge organization, how is it that, are, are you planning to sort of be able to roll out these lessons to federal managers, to organizations, so they can start implementing these approaches themselves, and learning from your experience in ways that, that they can actually do themselves, rather than coming to you and saying, please fix this for us? Yeah, um, Garen first, and then I'll talk a little bit about what a is doing. OK, uh, well, I appreciate the question, and uh, appreciate it? having some of our colleagues from government here. Um, w what we talk about sometimes within the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, given that we have a sort of finite surface area, so to speak, right, is having a one-to-many relationship with uh, federal agency partners. So how can we tackle problems that are affecting not just one agency, but many agencies. How can we focus on uh, uh, sort of services that affect citizens by and large, sort of agnostic of the federal agencies that might deliver those, right? So some of the things that we're tackling within 18F and the Presidential Services, Pro uh, Presidential Innovation Fellows Program and the broader sort of digital services coalition involved uh, shared services. So how can we tackle things like uh, moving uh, federal services to the cloud, how can we uh, deal with problems like authentication, right, where if uh, I'll give you a sort of uh, user story um, to borrow, if I am a student uh, that wants to apply for financial aid, uh, my sort of journey may start on Google, right, and then, then Google will take me to studentaid.gov, which is an area of the Department of Education where I fill out the FAFSA, the Federal Application for Student Financial Aid. Um, as part of the FAFSA application process, I will end up on uh, the IRS website to uh, provide uh, 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 you know, tax returns from the previous year to see uh, how much aid I'm eligible for. And of course, IRS will ask for a new set of authentication uh, uh, details um, that are separate from uh, the Department of Education. I may end up on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau website to be able to research predatory lending practices and understand what my rights are uh, as a student, et cetera. So how can we actually find the layer of services that transcend um, the uh, uh, central user experience that sort of joins all those things together, which is I'm just a student looking for aid. If you want to organize in this bureaucratic way, um, you know, because it's a more efficient way to maybe deliver certain aspects of these services, um, then that shouldn't really affect my, my overall experience. So that's one area that we're looking at, those common and shared services. Um, another thing is making sure that uh, the best practices are shared um, so that uh, we document uh, the, and, and, and sort of facilitate knowledge transfer. And I think Hillary is sort of best suited to talk about some of the in-house evangelism and documentation that we do, particularly in 18F, to sort of share uh, what we're doing uh, with other agencies. 
Yeah, I mean, Garen's right. I mean, essentially, we have a, a bird's eye view being able to work with so many different agencies. We've worked with over 20 different agencies. So we've been very strategic uh, and, and kind of tactical from the beginning about it being part of our intake checklist. Like, is this a project that we think is not just specific to this agency, but that there's some characteristic that could be applied you know, more broadly? So that's been part of our kind of our checklist from the beginning. Um, and we've definitely taken a page out of the GDS's playbook, so the Government Digital Service in the UK, the, the, the the group that's, that runs gov.uk and has been kind of doing all of this that we're doing for a few years now. They're a few years ahead of us. Um, but we've taken a page straight out of their playbook, which is essentially document the heck out of everything, uh, try to talk about things that we're doing as much as possible, both, both what we're shipping and how we're doing it. Um, and then also, uh, again, sort of like packaging those things up for reuse. So uh, we've got a, an ecosystem that we call uh, guides. So if you go to uh, 18f.gov, you can sort of, you, you can kind of browse around, but essentially you'll, you'll, you might find a section on our website if you're, if, if it's, if I'm thinking product correctly. Group, What's that? Product of the working group. It's absolutely a product of one of the working groups, that's right. But, uh, so we have a, a series of guides, so, and anybody can essentially put forth a, a guide, can, can, can write something up. We've got GitHub tutorials, we've got how do we do design studios, we've got uh, our content guide, which is, uh, which is essentially our team's editorial guide, you know, our, our internal, um, you know, AP style book, if you will. So we're really trying to just write everything down uh, for ourselves so we can dog feud it, and because, uh, you know, our team is going to kind of, we're going to move in cycles with the folks coming through 18F so that people that come after us have those resources, but also so that anybody, government or uh, private sector, can also use the same resources. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone. Thank that you is so much. all the time we have left. Please give 18F and Hillary and our team a huge round of applause. <laughs>